Okay, <laughs> there we have it. Oh, can I see my notes on the bottom? No, it's too small. Okay, so I guess I'm going to just read and do it this way. Yeah, <laughs> I wrote all these nice notes just to make sure it was going to flow really well. But anyway, um, yes, my name is Christine. Um, and uh, today um, I've been asked to um, just to talk about how uh, blood pressure and um, diabetes affects your kidneys. So this is, I will say that this is a fairly basic um, presentation, um, not too complex. I wasn't anticipating uh, someone like Anita on there who also still has um, a lot of knowledge of kidney disease, but um, I hope that everybody will find something that they can learn or review today. So um, my objective today is, first of all, we're going to review some kidney basics. Um, we're going to discuss the conditions of high blood pressure and um, diabetes, um, and then talk about how they can affect the kidneys. And then we're going to um, just look at how we can try to keep our kidneys healthy by managing these conditions. So if I was to ask you um, what you know about your kidneys, um, where they are, um, what, what they look like, um, what do they do? Most people, I think, would probably have a vague answer that they may know that they, we have two, um, and they might know that they're in the abdominal area, maybe some people may know that they're in the back, and um, most people would know that they um, produce urine. But actually, your kidneys have um, very many important functions. Um, it's a kind of forgotten organ, and uh, when they don't work, then you know you really know about it. So let's start about where they're located. So we have two kidneys. They are located in the, uh, in the lower abdomen, but at the back. They are um, at both sides of the um, spinal cord and they're protected by the rib cage. Um, the size of the kidney, if you were to uh, look at it, it and clench your fist, it's roughly the size of a clenched fist. Um, the kidneys are um, fed by two major blood vessels here, the arterial and the venous, um, no, renal, <laughs> I'm talking about here, the renal artery and the renal vein. And then afterwards, these will branch off and split into many other arteries which feed these areas of the kidney which contain many many millions of um, tiny filtering units so what do your kidneys do so as i say i think most people would be able to tell us that they produce urine. But in the urine, um, basically your kidneys will filter waste products and toxins from the blood through these very tiny filters. Um, it balances the amount of fluid that you have in your body. So if you drink too much, uh, normal kidneys will just make you go to the bathroom more frequently and then the body will hold on to whatever is uh, really needed. Um, it helps to control the blood pressure through producing a hormone, which is a messenger um, uh, called renin. Um, it produces another hormone, which is erythropoietin, and that helps to assist in making the red blood cells that carry the oxygen and the nutrients around the body. And it also helps to keep the bones healthy by balancing minerals in the foods that we eat, such as calcium and phosphorus. So 
So um, your kidneys, as I say, are really important um, organs. Um, if they become damaged, um, you know, you, you, you can go into what we call renal failure. So your, the kidneys can be affected by many conditions. Some of them are inherited um, and some of them are autoimmune, but the ones that we're talking about today are the chronic diseases, which happen to be the most common reason why um, patients end up with um, renal disease. If your kidneys become damaged, they don't recover. And if they don't, if they are damaged, they don't filter very well. So you basically affecting the um, filtering units of the um, kidney. Um, the poisons then begin to build up. So the um, poisons that we're talking about are urea and creatinine. So a doctor will, you know, look at the levels of that in your blood to be able to give, the, give you an idea of what's going on with your kidneys. Um, if, if you do have kidney injury or you do have um, some damage to the kidney, um, most often this is progressive and um, that can lead to chronic kidney disease or, or chronic renal failure. And um, as, it, as the urine output goes down and as the function of the kidney uh, decreases, then eventually you would end up in kidney failure or renal failure. So what happens when your kidneys uh, fail? Um, basically, you're no longer healthy. So uh, people will present um, feeling generally unwell. They have extreme tiredness and lack of energy. They have uh, decreased or no appetite. Nausea and vomiting are common, um, common symptoms. They have a bad taste in their mouth. Um, they have uh, a, an unusual smell on their breath, which is ammonia smelling. Um, they have decreased urine outputs, as I say, and because they're not putting out as much fluid, then the fluid has to find somewhere to stay in the body. So then they present with swollen feet, hands, face, and um, if it's really bad, then the fluid also goes to the lungs and then they present with shortness of breath. So when your kidney function is so low that it cannot support your life, um, and there is a measure um, that we use to um, see the progression, um, then you, the, the requirement to stay alive basically is to have the life-saving treatment of blood cleaning, which we call dialysis. So I'm not gonna really go into dialysis, but if um, people have questions about dialysis, I can you know, answer those things. So um, really today is about looking at common conditions that can affect the kidney. And uh, the two most common conditions are um, high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, and diabetes. So let's uh, look at blood pressure first. So what's your blood pressure? The blood pressure is, uh, it's a measurement of the blood uh, as it is in the blood vessels and moving around the body. So um, we measure this in two, with two numbers, um, the systolic, which is the top number where your heart is contracting, and the diastolic, which is where the um, heart rests, and that's the lower number. So if I will show you here. So a good blood pressure would be um, 120 over 80 or less than that. Um, the blood pressure, if it starts to go above that level, um, is considered to be high. And so, you know, 
there are varying degrees of high and because I am um, dealing with dialysis patients, sometimes, you know, the blood pressure can go um, 170, 180. Um, obviously, those are going to require more medication, but, um, you know, people get used to having blood pressures as high as that. Um, high blood pressure, we call the silent killer. Um, the reason for this is that um, sometimes patients can have um, no symptoms at all. They don't know that their blood pressure is high. Um, and even if it's very severe, unless, you know, they have uh, severe headaches, they may not even know that anything is going on. And so I personally have had patients that did not know anything was wrong with their blood pressure and um, they ended up just um, feeling probably some of those symptoms that I had already discussed. And when they went to emerge, their blood pressure is high, they take the blood work and um, they're already in um, renal failure. So those are what we call uh, those crash starts that end up you know, just being on dialysis, not really knowing anything about it. But the ideal thing would be to um, know what's going on with the blood pressure so that um, we can try to prevent uh, renal failure. So as I said, high blood pressure, if it's untreated, it, you know, it, it can be very dangerous. Um, can cause an enlarged heart, can damage your eyes, it can um, give you a stroke, and of course it can lead to kidney failure and then um, the resulting dialysis. So who's at risk for high blood pressure? So um, me, <laughs> uh, just because of my um, descent, so African and Asian descent, tend to have more of a, um, a tendency to have high blood pressure. Um, it runs in the family. Um, and if you have a first degree relative, like a mother or father that has high blood pressure, um, it's quite likely that you are going to be predisposed to having high blood pressure yourself. Um, as we advance in age, uh, it's more likely that we can have high blood pressure. Being overweight, uh, another reason, if we are not physically active and if you are using tobacco, smoking, um, that tends to constrict the blood vessels as well. And so that also will predispose you to having high blood pressure and also eating too much salt in the diet. So um, let's talk a little bit now about um, diabetes. So diabetes is another chronic condition um, where the body cannot use um, sugar normally. So glucose and sugar are the main sources of energy for the um, cells in the body. And in order to utilize that, we need the hormone insulin, which helps the sugar to move into the cells. So in diabetes, the blood sugar does not go into the cells, but instead it stays in the blood. So um, that results in high blood sugar. So the reason why this happens, so for most for most of the type one diabetes, this is because there is poor production of insulin. So basically they don't have enough insulin to help the sugar get into the cells. Um, type two diabetes usually occurs later in life and more likely as a result of some of the things that I've already talked about, where um, there is a reduced sensitivity of the cells to insulin. Either way, um, the blood sugar stays in, the blood sugar is high and the, um, the uh, 
sugar cannot go into the cells. So um, the patient will, will have symptoms that lack energy um, and um, you know thirsty. I should have put in a slide. I'm sorry, I didn't put in a slide that um, gave you some of those symptoms. But again, um, if you don't know that your uh, blood sugar is high, it's hard to be able to treat it. So I've just put in here a normal blood sugar level would be 3.9 to um, 6.1. Uh, people can be pre-diabetic that they're not quite diabetic, but um, a large portion of the population already are pre-diabetic. So the, the um, level is um, more than 6.1, but um, less than seven. Um, but that does also mean that you are at risk of having diet, full blown diabetes later on. So um, again, I've said that diabetes is one of the leading causes of uh, kidney disease. Um, high blood pressure over high blood sugar over time causes damage to the kidney vessels. And so once that happens, um, it causes narrowing of those most, the smaller vessels that lead to the filtering units. And um, it, so the flow is impeded and the capacity of the kidney to filter is also uh, decreased. So if you have both diabetes and high blood pressure, this will even more increase the risk of you developing renal failure. So who is at risk of having diabetes? So, I'm, and when I'm saying diabetes, I'm talking about type two diabetes because type one mostly um, occurs um, in um, the younger population, but for uh, type two, this is um, as we age. So again, some things we can change and some things that we can't. So um, the race, if you're black or South Asian, you are two to four times more likely to develop um, diabetes. If you have a family history uh, with a first line relative, a parent, a brother or a sister that has uh, diabetes, again, you're more likely to get it. Um, as we increase in age, we're more likely to get it. If we're overweight, we are more likely to get it. Um, not being physically active, this increases the possibility of you um, becoming type two diabetic. Um, smoking again, um, because of the constrictions that it causes with the blood vessels and anything that is going to affect the um, flow of blood to the kidney is going to cause um, a risk of renal failure. And also, if you had gestational diabetes, which is um, diabetes in pregnancy, then you are also more likely to develop diabetes later on in life. So how would you know if you might have some kidney, um, signs of kidney disease? Again, we will go back to some of those symptoms. Basically, you're feeling very unwell. Um, there is a level of fatigue. La the, the urine output decreases. You may have some swelling in the ankles and uh, fingers. Again, that's because you're not producing as much urine because the kidney is not um, putting out as much urine. So that extra fluid has to find somewhere to stay in the body. So you'll find it in the tissues and you also will find it in dependent areas like in the ankles and the legs. Um, if it does become bad, then it's because there is also fluid now moving to the lungs. And of course, that takes up breathing space. So people end up with breathing problems. 
You may have irritated skin from um, the crystals of, of uh, urea and creatinine being deposited underneath the skin. Nausea and vomiting, just because um, you, you're, you're basically your blood is being poisoned by uh, the high levels of urea and creatinine. The metallic flavor in the mouth, um, people complain about that. And um, they have trouble concentrating and some, if it's very severe, they have uh, confusion. So let's say that I th um, I'm suspecting that I have kidney problems and I'm hoping that everybody's not going to run away thinking, oh my goodness, I've got kidney disease because I've got one or two of these things. I've got nausea and vomiting. There are other reasons why you could have that as well. But if you do um, suspect that there is a possibility that you might have some kidney problems, the best thing to do is go to your family doctor and talk to them about those symptoms so that um, a diagnosis can be made very easily with a blood test. Uh, the main thing to remember is the early referral to a kidney specialist is essential. Um, your kidney specialist is your nephrologist because the early detection can cause the nephrologist to start to put things in place that they can manage those contributing factors, such as their high blood pressure, um, to really try to slow the progression of um, kidney disease. Because remember I said that once you, you do have some kidney disease, um, we, it, it, it's, a, it's a progressive thing. So there are stages of kidney failure, um, one to five. So if you, you actually find the kidney disease in the earlier stages, stage one or two, then that's the time that they would be able to um, help with diet control um, and blood pressure management to really delay the onset of um, the requirement for dialysis. So I, in the past, I've had patients that um, had renal problems and they've known about it for maybe 10 or even more years before they uh, eventually needed to be on dialysis. Um, so early detection is crucial and managing those contributing factors from high blood pressure and uh, diabetes is um, also a way to help protect your kidney. So the aim, as I said, is to keep you off dialysis and really to slow the decline for as long as possible. So then, let's talk about how we can keep the kidneys healthy. So first of all, since we're talking about um, high blood pressure and diabetes, there, we've got to manage those risks. If we reduce the, the, the risk of these two chronic diseases, um, we reduce the risk of getting kidney failure. So I have here a slide which shows um, kidney disease in the middle um, and of course, some of these things, family history and your age, these are non-modifiable um, things. So we, we don't have any control over these, but we do have control over smoking. Um, we, we want to try to reduce the risk of diabetes. We want to try to reduce the risk of high blood pressure. We want to try to reduce the risk of um, heart disease and um, also um, decreasing obesity is going to help all of these three things. Okay, so we're gonna talk about our diet. So the first thing that we can do is eat a healthy, balanced diet. And so here I, I, I pulled off this um, picture, um, which was from Canada's Food Guide, and it actually, yeah, okay. Um, 
it actually shows the portioning on the plate. So um, here's your starch. <laughs> Here is, um, I think, a protein section. In, so it's like one quarter of your plate called, uh, should be protein, one quarter should be um, starchy, and then at least half fruits and vegetables to balance your, um, your diet. So um, you can go onto the Canada's Food Guide yourself and um, look for more specifics in regards to that if, if need be. So let's talk about this thing, sodium. So our sodium intake should really be between five to 15%. And 15 really is like the top end. Um, 10 would be better. And so when we are um, you know, shopping, you should really be aware of some key words that um, are talking about the sodium content in the diet. So, or in that thing that you are trying to purchase. So anything that says salted, cured, smoked, pickled, or processed, um, guaranteed that that has a high level of um, sodium or salt intake in there. I remember salt is the thing that we're trying to reduce, especially if we have um, a risk towards high blood pressure. So I also have here, although I can't, I can't move this picture. <laughs> oh, um, so we have here a low sodium soy sauce, which is covered up by, by um, this thing here. I don't know if they can see it. And also um, you could use low salt alternatives. You, um, you see this Mrs. Dash, they have um, things, other things that are salt free that you can still season and use um, to, um, you know, to make your food more interesting without the salt content in the diet. So um, lots of variation here. Um, be careful about reading labels. So this one is from a, a regular chicken soup noodle base and you can see it's got 37 percent um, of the normal sodium so 890 milligrams of sodium um, that's a lot compared to the low sodium chicken noodle soup which only has 140 milligrams or six percent of um, salt in um, the same chicken soup probably Campbell's or something like that. So read your labels and pay more attention to um, the nutritional facts that are on there. They are giving you um, a clue about um, what, what, what you're eating. I do notice though that um, this one seems like um, it has less calories for the higher sodium and um, on this side, lower sodium, but higher calories you know, I guess uh, I, I'm not quite sure why, they, why they've made it that way, but um, either way, just pay attention to the labels of the things that you are buying. So exercise. Um, exercising can really reduce um, the, the, the risk of doing, um, having high blood pressure and having diabetes. Um, I know that myself because um, personally, there was a time that I um, had um, a lot of stress in my life and um, I was told that I had to take blood pressure medication. And so I, I decided I'm going to really step up my exercise routine and really, you know, I, I saw the, the, the fact that I had done that really um, decreased the need for me to actually have to take those medications. So um, exercise really at least two, three times a week. I think, you know, whatever you can is, is um, going to help to keep your blood pressure in order. Even if you do um, have to take um, 
blood pressure medications, maybe you don't have to take as many. Maybe your blood pressure can be better controlled. So um, I think exercise not, not only is going to help with the um, high blood pressure, but also exercise can help you if you are diabetic. So it can help to lower the blood glucose levels very quickly. Um, it improves the body's ability to use the insulin, reduces the amount of insulin that is required. And um, of course, you're going to have better control of your diabetes if you do exercise. So whatever exercise you can do, um, and I'm going to give a plug for the um, virtual programs at Care First. You know, even if you're sitting at home, I've been trying to encourage my patients to, um, you know, do, use the chair and do some of the exercises that um, will keep them healthy during um, this time when we're all kind of in a different um, mode of our normalcy. Hydrate your kidney. So I am going to say, you know, we all know that we should drink um, I think it's six to eight glasses a day. I am very poor at that. But hydrating your kidney um, is important when you don't have um, kidney impairment. It will help to reduce the risk of infection and also um, kidney stones. But if you do have kidney impairment, um, that would have to be discussed with your dietitian because um, you know remember some of that is going to stay in your body so um, I say I've put that there but remember that does depend on whether you already have some impairment or not oh yes and how about not smoking um, again um, causing restrictions and constricting the blood vessels. So um, not smoking also can um, help to reduce the risk of those chronic conditions. I'm coming close. Yeah, I know you can. Be careful for um, using medications. Um, sometimes we will use medications that are, um, you know, over the counter and um, particularly the, um, the Advil type medication, I think they're NSAIDs, um, those do cause injury to the um, kidney. So I will also mention that um, using herbal herbal medications, you should, you should pay attention to that. And if you plan to use herbal medications, discuss them with your physician, particularly if you're on other medications. I um, did have one, I'll talk about this one um, situation where I had one um, young lady who was most unfortunate. She had um, a breakout of acne and um, she used a herbal medication that um, I guess was, was given to her because she was getting married and they wanted to make sure that uh, everything was, she was looking pretty. And um, after the marriage, she went straight into renal failure. And that was because the, whatever the herbal medication that she had taken had completely knocked out her kidney very unfortunately. And um, before she knew it, she was on dialysis. So um, be careful with your medication and um, pay attention to, um, you know, what, what you're already using, whether or not there may be interactions. Um, check with your family physician. And I put this here, get regular checkups. Yeah, because um, this is for me, myself. Um, I'm, I'm also preaching to myself when I say uh, that, you know, you, if you don't know about it, you can't fix it. So if you don't know that you've got high blood pressure, we can't treat it. So unless you go to the doctor and take um, those regular checkups and 
you know, um, or buy a, a, a blood pressure monitor and check your blood pressure regularly, especially as we uh, get older. Um, you know, you can't do anything about it if you don't know about it. So go and do those regular checkups. And I'm telling myself that as well. <laughs> So just to review, and I think I'm um, on good time, um, the kidney has many important functions in your body. Um, diabetes and high blood pressure are both common causes of renal failure and um, amounts for, I think, at least 50% of the ones that um, when I was working in the dialysis unit, like about 50% of them had um, had uh, renal problems because of diabetes and high blood pressure. So again, if there's long-term damage to the kidney, it does not repair. Um, trying to avoid these two conditions will really keep your kidney healthy. If you eat a healthy diet, have good hydration, do regular exercise, um, these are important things for keeping your um, kidney healthy. Um, avoid smoking um, and, um, you know, be careful about those over-the-counter medications. Go to your family physician and have those regular checkups, if, um, especially if you have um, high blood sugar or high blood pressure. We need to manage these conditions very strongly to be able to... Um, avoid kidney disease. So high blood pressure and um, high blood sugar can damage your kidneys. But we should remember that healthy kidneys are happy kidneys. So take care of them. And that's the end. Am I on time? <laughs> Good. Perfect timing. Okay, good. Okay, so now some questions, if they have them. Yes. Uh, so the first question is from uh, Francis Chan. Uh, and he said, I understand that some people may have more than a pair of kidneys, uh, say three in total on one side. Is that a health risk for such a person? Or and is there any life any precaution that they should take? So to be honest, I have never known uh, my, and we, I'll, I'm going to open that up to uh, Anita as well. I don't know all the time that I um, uh, have been in dialysis, which has been since the 1990s. Um, I have not known of anybody that had three kidneys. So that's really unusual for me. Um, I, the, the fact is, if you have only one kidney, um, you can still function very normally um, with just one. So I'm presuming that the three are probably going to do the same thing. Um, and it's just there um, unless, it's, unless it's infected um, or diseased or, or has, um, you know, affected by cysts, uh, polycystic kidney. Um, I don't think it would be um, an issue or an, of course, if there was cancer in there, but um, usually if even with um, the kidney not functioning well and it stops working and you end up on dialysis, they don't take those kidneys out. They just stay there. And um, if you get a, a transplanted kidney, they put an additional one in. So then you would have three anyway even though two of them are not working. So I hope that I, I don't know about the, th the third kidney. I would have to look that one up. So, you know, if he could share something about the third kidney, I'd be interested to hear. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so the second question is from uh, Tomat. Uh, and he said, uh, the person asked, is it common that when we're getting older that breast pressure increases? And if, it's, if so, if it's higher than 120, is that acceptable? So yeah, um, it is common as we get older for blood pressure to increase. Because one of the reasons why it's increasing is because um, there is a narrowing in the blood vessels from years of eating all of the wrong foods and you know, then your cholesterol levels are high. So anything that causes a narrowing to the blood vessels 
is going to um, put you uh, at risk for high blood pressure and renal disease. So if um, you have a blood pressure of 120 over 80, you know, that's, that's still considered good. So, you know, I think he's um, in a good place. I think if you're starting to go near 130 or, or more, more than that, certainly, then they would want to start um, using medication. And I will say this, um, particularly in um, the situation where um, you don't feel any symptoms, you don't think that, uh, that it's that important to take the medication. If the doctor tells you you need blood pressure medications, take them. Because again, in my experience, I have seen patients that have ended up being on dialysis because simply they didn't take the blood pressure medications. They didn't feel that they were sick. They didn't think that they needed to do it. Uh, the first question is from Sonia, uh, and the question is, uh, will you discuss alcohol use, alcohol use in connection of kidney problems? Alcohol. Okay. So I don't, um, I know that we, we, we don't restrict people from drinking alcohol. Um, if the, even when they're on dialysis, they, they, they say everything has to be in limitation. Um, um, if the kidneys are already, you know, compromised, um, I, I don't think it would be wise to go on a, you know, an alcohol binge. Um, what they would be concerned about is the fluid, the amount of fluid um, that, that drinking that alcohol would be. Like, um, if you're drinking so many glasses of beer, that's a lot of fluid. And some of that fluid is not going to um, be excreted by the kidney if you've already got kidney impairment. So it's again, it's going to stay with you. It's going to go to your your um, your blood vessels. Your um, you know, it causes your heart to have to pump harder. You know, so really, I think it's about the amount of fluid, um, and it would depend on the 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 alcohol. What, whatever it is you're, you're drinking, but I know that they, they, they do allow them certain amounts but they, they of, of beer, but again, the concern is the amount, so yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is from Catherine Lee, uh, and she is asking, could you please talk briefly about dialysis? And then she wants to okay. thank you as well. <laughs> Okay, so dialysis, yes, that's my, my area. So there are two types of dialysis. So dialysis means blood cleaning. There are two types. So one is um, peritoneal dialysis, and that one is indirect contact with the blood. So um, basically the patient has a tube that is placed in the abdomen and um, it has an extension attached to it and then we are able to put in fluid that runs into the um, abdomen and sit on the outside of the peritoneum. So the peritoneum is the filter that we use and the body's natural filter and we use that to be able to achieve the same blood cleaning as um, if your kidneys were working. Now with hemodialysis, that is where it's direct blood contact. So that's the one where you have the big hemo machine. They usually go to centers, although we can do it at home as well, but you, you're actually pulling the blood out of the body, a small amount of blood out of the body, cleaning it in an, an, in an artificial kidney, and then sending it back to the patient. So that's the continuous process. So with hemodialysis, it's three times a week usually, um, often in the hospital, um, and um, unless the patient is doing, um, deciding to train to do it themselves, that's where it is. 
um, with peritoneal dialysis, this is the more home-based kind of dialysis, and that's what um, Care First is currently involved in. So the Integrated Dialysis Care Program is um, where I actually send in nurses to help patients that can't do that themselves. They can't do the peritoneal dialysis themselves, or we continue to teach them until they're able to do that. So those are the two forms of dialysis. Okay, the next question is from uh, Robia Chiu. Um, I, the question is about diabetes and COVID-19. But I think, uh, Robia, I think uh, last week's topic, uh, if you can still okay. go on a uh, YouTube a video, uh, the, there's a whole talk on that. So we, you, I think you can look at that, it will be better. Uh, the next question from Erica Chu. Uh, once you start taking high blood, high blood pressure pills, uh, is there a way to cut it out completely? Yes, exercise. <laughs> well, it really depends on how high it is. So I, I like I said, um, if you exercise and reduce the salt and, um, you know, um, really are careful with your diet, um, I I personally knew, know that it is possible to come off it, but obviously if your blood pressure is like sky high, you know, and that you're needing more than one blood pressure pill, then it's more difficult. So again, I would say it depends on how high your blood pressure is, um, how many blood pressure pills you're taking, and um, you know, the, I, the progression of how, how bad your hypertension is. Okay, uh, the next comment is from Addis Lamb. Uh, so we just want to thank you for the informative presentation. And oh, thank you. Just wants to say God bless you and your family. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is from Victoria. Uh, she wants to know uh, what is the risk of having heart attack for dialysis patients? Um, uh, very high. Uh, yes, very high. To be honest, um, most patients, once they, once they get on, uh, dialysis. Um, they don't die of kidney disease, they die of heart disease <laughs> or um, complications from that. And particularly if they've got those two comorbidities, as we talk about, if they've got um, high blood pressure and they've got diabetes, the risk of having um, heart disease and um, heart attacks and um, you know, dying from um, that condition is very high. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from Robia Chiu. Uh, I heard that some countries are adjusting the standard measure for uh, high blood pressure to 140 over 80. Does that apply for Canada? No. <laughs> no. Uh, Canada's is quite low. Um, um, before, I think it used to be 130. Um, they were they were thinking about 130, but um, the the these days the guidelines they realize that um, people do much better even for those that are on dialysis. We try to keep their blood pressures um, on the lower side uh, because they have they're less likely to have um, cardiac or cardiovascular events. Okay, uh, uh, Robia, I'll send you the the YouTube link for the um, for the video so you can check. Uh, so I'm just going to send it to everyone now. Actually, uh, let's see. So next question: I heard that you mentioned six glasses of water. Are you recommending six cups of water a day, or eight, or is eight cups better? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I personally, I mean, I wish I could drink eight cups. I tell you, I don't even drink four or five cups, which, you know, for a dialysis nurse is really bad. Um, I just get busy and, you know, unless you have that there with you, I think, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard to do that. But, you know, hydration is good and um, it's not going to hurt you to drink more fluid unless you've got kidney um, problems. And certainly, like I said, the, if you drink lots of fluid, you know, you're not gonna have stagnant urine sitting around, so less risk of infection. You're, you're um, less likely to have the, the stones 
you know, that um, kidney stones that build up in, especially in the tubules. Um, so um, I think it's not bad to drink eight if you can do it and you don't have kidney problems. Okay, uh, the next, uh, Anita wants to thank you for the session as well. Uh, Anita, Anita, ask Anita if she has anything else to add. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, you, you, you've done an excellent job, Christine. That's, that, that's really good. Yeah, very sweet and simple. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, next question. If your A1C is about 7.5, is there a way to reverse diabetes? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I don't. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mention this because um, I am aware of it. Um, so we do at Scarborough Hospital we do have a um, physician, a nephrologist, who really um, that's his passion about reversing diabetes, and so he um, and it's really about the 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 um, sensitivity when, when people have um, insulin, insulin insensitivity, he, that's his focus. So what he does is he puts people on intermittent fasting. And um, so they, they would, they would um, maybe have no food from supper time till the next supper time. And then the next day, um, they would um, eat normally. Um, well, actually, when I say normally, meaning like healthy, and then afterwards do um, fasting the next day. And he's had great success um, with having patients not, not need as much insulin and have their blood sugars come down and um, have um, much better control. Um, and um, he, he even wrote a book. So that, that's Dr. Fung at Scarborough Hospital that um, he deals with the intermittent fasting. So um, I just know that he's had success and that's why I put that out there. But I don't know of anything miraculous to, um, you know, reverse the diabetes. But I think he has had good results with that. So maybe they want to look into that. I think he has a book as well. And that's uh, Dr. Fung, Jason Fung. Anita, you want to say anything on that? No, no, I think, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's the one that uh, has been advocating reverting, you know, diabetes, but uh, it's, it's a very stringent program, I think. And uh, people really need to understand a little bit more before they get involved in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Um, and then, uh, Clifford, you're right. The last two YouTube video, uh, sessions have not been uploaded. I still need to do a little bit of editing on it, uh, but it should be uploaded by uh, this week. Uh, I said there's one more question. I'm just going to launch a poll first. Okay. And then there's one more. Uh, one more question from Estella. Uh, so I'm a di Estella says I have diabetes and I drink more than ten cups of water a day. Is it is it the sim and is is it good for diabetes and is it good for health? To drink the fluid. I guess yeah. I guess she's asking if she drinks ten cups of water a day. Is that good for diabetes and and is that good for health? I I, I think that I don't know if it's um if it will do anything to her diabetes, it certainly will, you know, help protect the kidney. But I think the main thing to help her kidney is to control her diabetes. So anything that she can do to keep the blood sugar levels um, even and, um, you know, to, to really stay within um, good blood sugar limits, and not be um, moving up and down um, the scale. I think that's the key to um, helping her kidneys stay healthy. Uh, we also have a comment from uh, Robert uh, saying that his blood sugar would drop without food. 
uh, so no fasting uh, for him. Right, and that's that's the reason why um, I I agree with with um, with Anita. You know, like um, some some patients, you know, they. I don't know enough about his regime. I just know that he has had some success, but yeah, um, it's it, it, particularly with when they're diabetic, they, they required a lot of uh, monitoring and, um, you know, um, instruction from Dr. Fung as they went through that program. Uh, and then there's uh, one more question from Teresa. Okay, so is it very bad if my if kidney only has 25% function? Um, so I'll say 15, once you get to 15% function, that is where um, the need for dialysis um, comes in. So you know, um, again, anything you can do to slow, to, to keep your kidneys healthy is the important thing because, um, you know, dialysis is very restrictive. It does affect um, a lot of uh, areas in your life, you know, um, it affects the people financially because they, they can't work, they don't have the energy and everything. So, you know, anything you can do to control these chronic diseases and keep them in check is going to support kidney health. Okay, and I think that's all the questions we have and that's all the time we have for today as well. Thank you once again, Christine, and thank you everyone for coming. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Christine. Thank you, Miss Anita. <laughs> oh, it's always it's always very refreshing. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Christine. So, thank you, everyone, for listening. You. I appreciate you taking the time thank out you. to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.